Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and thank you for joining us on this webinar. I am Alok Chandra, the eldest son of uh, the late Professor Satish Chandra, who passed away on this date in 2017, age 95, and in whose memory this, the second Professor Satish Chandra Memorial Lecture is being held. I myself live in Bangalore, where I've been since 1986 as an independent wine consultant. The first lecture was held on the same date last year. It was held in Delhi uh, at the Indian International Center with an introduction by the late Shri T.N. Chaturvedi, uh, IAS officer, and delivered by the historian Professor Irfan Habib on reading medieval India with Professor Satish Chandra. This year, we had again booked space at the India International Center in Delhi for 150 people. But then came COVID-19 and everything changed. I'm told that we have some 1,750 people registered for this talk. Um, and with only 500 being able to see it live on Zoom, the rest would be, who are attending, would be on YouTube. And anybody who misses the talk today can go to YouTube tomorrow or thereafter, where the talk would be uploaded. All this has only been possible with the unstinting support extended by the Bangalore International Center and its director, uh, Mr. Ravi Chandar. Um, the format for this session is very briefly that after me, Professor Mridhara Mukherjee will introduce both Professor Chandra and Professor Ramila Thapar followed by the lecture by Professor Thapar. Questions, if any, can be posted in the question and answer box uh, on the BIC screen. And uh, after the lecture, Professor Mukherjee will come back and post a few questions, relevant questions on the, which have, you know, on the talk. And uh, at the end, my youngest brother, Akhil, will deliver a vote of thanks. To briefly introduce Professor Mukherjee, uh, she taught history at the JNU Center for Historical Studies for four decades, up to 2014. In between, she was director of the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, 2006 to 2011. She's been a student and associate of Professor Chandra. She appears frequently on TV on historical topics and has numerous books and articles published over the years. I take this opportunity to remember Professor Satish Chandra, my younger brother Sunil, who passed away in 1999, Shri T.N. Chaturvedi, who expired in January 2020, pre-COVID, and all those associated with my late father who are with us today only in spirit. I handing over to Professor Mithura Mukherjee. Thank you, uh, Alio. <clears throat> I'm very grateful uh, to Alok as uh, well as to other members of the family uh, for giving me this opportunity to pay my uh, tribute to Professor Satish Chandra. I'm also very honored to be chairing a lecture delivered by my very senior colleague, Professor Ramila Thapar. I would like to begin by paying my own small tribute to Professor Satish Chandra whom I had the opportunity of knowing over many years, beginning with when I became a student at the Center for Historical Studies in 1971, as part of the MPhil program, the year that the center was started. And I do remember I invited him to come and give a talk at a college at which I was teaching then. And he didn't know me from Adam, but he readily accepted and very graciously came over and delivered the talk to undergraduate students. Uh, it is very difficult to, in a very uh, short period of time, uh, to even begin to talk about Professor Satish Chandra. Uh, in a long career that was spanning over seven decades, he had multiple achievements to his credit. His first and foremost achievement was as a young scholar when he wrote his first major work, Parties and Politics at the Mughal Court, 1707 to 1740, in which he overturned the existing wisdom about the causes of the decline of the Mughal Empire. 
he questioned the notion that it was Aurangzeb's religious policy which lay at the heart of the decline and argued that it was a structural crisis in the Jagirdari system which caused the decline and ultimate downfall of the Mughal Empire. By doing this, he made a fundamental contribution to our understanding of history by demonstrating that the causes of major shifts or changes in history have to be located in broader economic, social, and political structures, and not in one or the other policy of one ruler or another. He also relegated the role of religion in determining policy to where it belonged, along with other factors, and not as a sole or a primary factor. In later years, he pioneered the shift to the study of regional forces by focusing on sources in regional languages. Over time, there was hardly any aspect or period of medieval Indian history that escaped his sharp scrutiny. He was part of the galaxy of historians comprised of professors R. S. Sharma, Ramila Thapar, Bipin Chantra, and Arjun Dev, who took time off from their research to write textbooks for school children published by the NCERT. And his Medieval India for School Students made him a household name. The book is still being published and sold in thousands uh, by a private publisher after the NCERT decided that it was too good for it. He too had his book uh, removed uh, from the syllabus when the NDA government started to rewrite history in 2000-2001, as his secular and objective approach could hardly be expected to be appreciated by the RSS-inspired powers that be. Though he reached the pinnacle of academic administration as chairman of the University Grants Commission in the mid-1970s, and he continued in the UGC till 1980, and most people would be happy to hang up their boots after that, his first and lasting love remained academics, and he returned, therefore, to the Jawaharlal Nehru University as professor of medieval history. He also remained a stalwart of the Indian History Congress, which he served as secretary and adorned as its president decades ago. When its session was held at the JNU in 2014, I remember that he came to attend it straight from the hospital where he had gone for his dialysis. After he retired from JNU, he devoted his energies to developing an entirely new area of study by founding the Society of Indian Ocean Studies, which he nurtured till his last day, organizing conferences and bringing out a journal. Even when his health suffered and he had to undergo dialysis every alternate day, which he did for years, he continued to go to the office of the society on all other days. Such was his dedication that when the society suddenly lost its office a few years ago, overnight he shifted the office to his residence in Vasant Kunj and its work continued unhindered in its new environment. I would also like to place it on record, a fact that I came to know later, after he had left us, that he had also put in large amounts of his own savings in, to make the society, uh, if, to make it possible to continue running the society. He continued till the end to strive hard to get land and building for the, uh, for the office of the society. We were all very fortunate that we had the benefit of his wisdom, scholarship, and sage advice for so many years. I personally benefited from that a lot. I would go to him very often to seek his advice whenever I was in trouble, which was not that rarely. What was wonderful was that he remained mentally alert and active till his last days. The librarian at the Indian Council for Historical Research recounted to us how he would regularly get a call from Satish Saab, as he was fondly called, asking him to send over newly arrived books and how they would be duly returned a week later. When I would sometimes call to speak to him and on learning that he was undergoing dialysis, would quickly apologize and want to call off, he would say, carry on talking. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize two aspects of his contribution for which he will be sorely missed. One, while always remaining in touch with international trends in scholarship, 
He did not get swayed by the latest flavor of the month emanating from Western academia. His work was deeply influenced by the anti-imperialist nationalist framework of the Allahabad school, where he did his entire higher education, as well as by the Marxist ideas current in his youth. And he remained rooted in that tradition. Two, he never wavered in his commitment to secularism and to the struggle against communalism in every form. This was true of his historical writing as well as of his public persona. In the present situation, when the battle for secularism and for democracy has become an urgent need, his, the loss of his firm and powerful voice is felt very deeply. But his life and work will continue to inspire those who look up to him as a beacon and guide us in these difficult times. I would now like very briefly to introduce Professor Romila Thapar, even though as all of you have testified by the large numbers in which you have flocked to register for this lecture, she really needs no introduction. But nevertheless, uh, let me uh, put it on record that Professor Thapar is Professor Emerita at the Center for Historical Studies, JNU, a center that she founded along with professors Satish Chandra, S. Gopal, and Bipin Chandra. She is the preeminent historian of ancient India, or early India, as she prefers to call it now. In the Center for Historical Studies, her contribution is remembered till today and will continue to be remembered for the very hard work and the brilliant new ideas that she and her contemporaries, the founders, brought to the study of history and particularly to the study of Indian history. They overturned many old methods, many old shibboleths, many old ways of teaching history in this center. Right from the method of teaching through tutorials and small classes to the subject matter, to shedding the the boundaries between different periods. If I, if I begin to talk about it, it will take a very, very long time. Professor Thapar's books include the very famous and popular Penguin History of Early India till 1300, which earlier was the History of India, Volume 1, Ashoka and the Decline of the Mauryas, which was her first work, Somanath, the History of Somanath, which she wrote a few years ago, and numerous other works with very interesting titles such as Past and Prejudice, The Past as Present, The Public Intellectual, and many, many others. Her major contribution was to turn the focus away from the history of dynasties and kings and wars to social and economic history. She questioned the widely prevalent colonial notion that Indians had no sense of history, and this <coughs> question informed a very wide body of her work over the years. She also rejected the idea of India as an unchanging society and showed how state formation took place in early India, thereby linking economic, technological, and social and political change. Professor Thapar is also a public intellectual in the best sense of the term always articulating her usually dissenting views on current issues fearlessly. Professor Thapar has also been the recipient of very prestigious uh, prizes and awards. I will only mention here the most famous of them all, the Klug Prize of the US Library of Congress, which is given for subjects which are not covered by the Nobel the Fukuoka Academic uh, Prize. She's also a fellow of the British Academy. And last year, she was honored by being made a member of the American Philosophical Society, a rare uh, honor, especially for a non-philosopher. I would now not like to stand between you and Professor Thapar and will now hand over the proceedings to her. Thank you. Um, I would like to begin by thanking Mr. Alok Chandra for inviting me to give this memorial lecture. 
in remembrance of his late father. My thanks also go to Professor Mridula Mukherjee. We've had a long innings together, first as uh, your being a student in the center and then as your being a colleague. And it is absolutely delightful for me to have you chair this lecture this evening. Thank you very much for agreeing to do so. I only hope that the nice things that you said about me will bear up in what I have to say in the next one hour. You may be in for a surprise. Um, I do feel deeply privileged by the invitation to give this year's memorial lecture in memory of the late Professor Satish Chandra. It is a privilege as it gives me yet another chance to honor a person who was not only a fellow historian, but also a much respected colleague. Uh, Mridula has in a sense summarized his major achievements, which were really enormous. And I can only, instead of repeating them, I will only say that really the most striking thing about him and a few other historians of that time was the fact that Indian history advanced out of a colonial perspective, out of even some aspects of nationalist historical writing, which was beginning to be questioned at that point. It advanced into a study of a history with a much broader perspective, uh, what we sometimes call interdisciplinary history, but that's a rather narrow way of defining it. And I would say it was, it was the kind of history that he and, uh, and others of that time initiated, uh, which answered many of the fundamental questions of who we are, what are we doing here, what is our society, what has been our past, uh, how does the past relate to the present? This was a very fundamental question that struck all of us at that time. Um, and we weren't doing it in a kind of automatic way that there is a continuity in chronology and in, in dates and periods and so on. But we were doing it in a much more fundamental way of trying to examine the nature of society in earlier periods and how that links up, if it does, as in many cases it does, uh, with what is happening in the present. In other words, how does one understand uh, the, the past in terms of its providing some kind of explanation that would help us understand the present. And inevitably, of course, if one understands the present in any kind of intensive analytical way, there is a, the beginnings of an understanding of what the future might hold. Uh, so it's this continuity that we were concerned with and, and also the fact of how it interrelated one with the other. And as Mridula has explained, these, the aspects and themes that he took up were very much the aspects and themes that led into this kind of analysis and made of history a very different kind of discipline from what it had been in uh, the period of a hundred years ago. My own specialization, as she mentioned, is in the early period, what used to be called ancient history, although I take it up a little further into the early uh, second millennium AD. Um, therefore, I shall be touching only partially on medieval times. I, I always say that I feel most comfortable when I'm talking about the BCs a little uh, less comfortable when I'm talking about the ADs, but really rather terrified when I move into the second millennium AD, as I shall be just touching uh, this, this evening. Uh, but hopefully that what I may have to say about this very early period uh, will have some resonance with what happened in the history of the later times. I have chosen to speak on the subject of migrants and the making of cultures in India. The choice of subject is in the nature of a plea that historians of India should give more attention to the importance of migrations 
in the creation of Indian cultures at various historical periods. Many histories treat the role of migration as marginal. This needs correction. If we recognize this role, we will have a better understanding of the cultures that resulted from the interface and, gave, and give credit to the process. I shall speak of three examples that demonstrate this process. I shall first refer to the migration of the Aryan speaking uh, people in the second millennium before Christ, BCE. Then I'll move forward a millennium or so in the period of the Kushans in the early centuries AD. And my third example will be from the second millennium AD with the Arab traders from across the Arabian Sea. One of the advantages of dealing with such a long history is that one can happily move from one millennium to another. Let me explain first why I chose these three examples. They are from different periods and they are distinct in terms of who migrated and why. The cultures that they helped to create took recognizably different forms. And we don't often recognize how much of our past we owe to migrant groups. Today, we may call them foreigners, but in earlier times, they were integrated with and contributed to the host culture and its heritage in India, the host culture being India. My examples are from neighboring areas outside the subcontinent. But before I discuss migration, let me clarify one confusion that is commonly made Migration should not be mistaken for invasion. The two must be differentiated and the difference made clear. Among the features of an invasion, invasion are that every invasion can be dated to a specific point in time. We always talk about the invasion taking place in a particular year. Um, the invasion always involves a large body of trained and armed soldiers who use the maximum violence to conquer and loot the region that they attack. If they are victorious and decide to settle in the area, they take over its governance and appropriate its revenue. The cultural distinction between the local and the foreign is determined by the nature of the invasion and governance. It can merge into a continuation from the past with a minimal change, or it can be strikingly different. Migration by contrast is entirely different in its historical impact. It is not a uniform process for all times. Each one differs defined by who came, from where, and why, and where did they settle. It involves many people who move from one geographical area to another in small groups at a leisurely pace with the intention of settling in the new geographical area to which they move. Migrations from and to broadly the same areas are known to have continued for sometimes a century or even more in small dribs and drabs, as it were. Migrants transported some of their goods and their chattel, and this showed, slowed down their movement, often halting temporarily en route. The new settlement was permanent. It could therefore be accommodated or contested by previous inhabitants. This was not on the scale of an invasion. Migrants, unlike soldiers, generally do not return to their original homeland. Migrations do not become invasions, and invasions can at most indicate the potential for migration. Forms of migration differ enormously, but the two very common ones in many parts of the world 
two categories of pre-modern times were pastoralists and traders. Pastoralists moved when their grazing grounds dried up or when others displaced them from their space. The movement of pastoralists was slow since animal herds often moved along with the herders. <clears throat> the route they chose had to have pa pastures along the way so that the animals could be fed. If there were settled societies en route, then negotiations could be required between the two and adjustments made to a new environment. Pastoral migrants look for familiar ecologies and areas of low population density. This was, of course, not a problem in ancient times. The search for pastures discouraged congregating in one place and migrants needed to fan out. Often the spreading took the form of a small group branching off and founding a new settlement. And this pattern was repeated again and again. The diversity in their patterns of living often reflect the diversity of local cultures, indicating where they had settled. Peasants, by contrast, seldom migrate. Being more rooted in the small areas that they cultivate, they tend on the whole not to migrate. Some references are made in the early texts to discontented peasants suffering from heavy taxation, leaving their land and migrating next door to the neighboring kingdom. And we're told that the kings always feared this because it meant a loss of revenue. The other group that I want to talk about that often migrated over long distances were of course traders, but in much smaller numbers than the pastoralists. Those that settled in a new place where there was a potential for trade were treated as migrants. However, depending on the items traded, they were required sometimes to retain contact with their homeland. This encouraged another difference from the pastoral pattern. Migrant traders often had partners in the host country. And these, in turn, could become migrants setting, settling in the area from which the migrant trader had come. For instance, when the trade with Central Asia became sizable, cities like Bukhara had specific mohallas, neighborhoods, where the Indian traders resided. And these mohallas are still pointed out when one goes to visit the cities. Thus, if correctly understood, patterns of migration introduce a new dimension to cultural interaction, making an impact on many patterns of living. This is central to the definition of cultural tradition. Historians these days are arguing that what we call tradition is invented and whenever required, and it is then legitimized by trying to find origins in the early past. But the inventions of patterns of living pick up items of belief and practice that come from many sources, including from groups that have migrated into an area and settled there. And this is an aspect that does need investigating. What is likely to be affected first is, of course, language. If the two languages of the migrant and the host society differ, as they frequently do, then one of them is adopted, or alternately, a mixed language emerges from the currency of two languages. The next step is for the migrant society to establish its status. If the migrants introduce a new and superior technology, as sometimes happens, then that influences status. Intermarriage is another method, and it is surprising how much intermarriage did take place, despite the rules that question it. <clears throat> 
And the third visible indicator is religion, as seen in changing forms, practices, sacred spaces, texts, icons, and so on. The question then is, do the cultures remain distinctive or is there a mutual incorporation of selected observances to a greater or lesser degree? It is at this point that identity becomes crucial. Language, social status, and religion contribute towards creating an identity. Does the emerging society declare itself as distinct and separate, or else does it get inducted into the host society, and thus a new community emerges from the interface? Identities, as we know, are consciously constructed and are multiple. And this multiplicity is apparent in history, even if we try and ignore it. Now, keeping all this in mind, let me turn to my examples. Going back to earliest times, evidence from Harappan sites suggested the possibility of small scale migrations, but the evidence is ambiguous. We have much more data about the subsequent migration, that of the Aryan speaking agro pastoralists moving from the Oxus region, just to the north of the mountains, the northern mountains of India, into northern India. Some today regard this as a controversial statement, since they maintain that there was no migration and that the Aryan speakers were indigenous to the subcontinent. But amongst most scholars who have researched the subject, there is a consensus on migration, not on invasion, but on migration. A century ago, the sources of this period were limited to the Vedic texts. But we now have to consider many uh, other sources and much more information. Among them, for instance, are the geographical and archaeological distribution beyond India of other Indo-European speakers, therefore related linguistically to the Indo-Aryan. Also, the data from linguistics on the structure of the Indo-Aryan language is important and revealing. And then the very recent evidence that everybody is very excited about uh, of, of the um, uh, the, which is now surfacing is that through the study of DNA and genetics. But the controversy does not affect what I have to say, which is the question of the juxtaposition of cultures. So I will set that controversy aside. I will instead speak of what these many sources tell us and how they introduce new aspects of this prolonged discussion. The culture of Vedic society in Northern India was something of an innovation. The previous Harappan culture was very different. The geographical area of the Harappa culture was extensive from the Pamis to Gujarat, taking in the entire Indus plain, the entire Indus system in fact, and across the Gulf to Oman, with some contacts extending to Mesopotamia, not sites, but contacts. Viewed from the Indus plain, it was essentially an activity focusing on areas to the south and the west of the Indus area. When we turn to the Rig Veda, the earliest Vedic composition, we find that it was unfamiliar with the larger part of this area, focusing only on the Upper Indus, the Punjab, and the Upper Doab. The subsequent Vedic texts look only eastwards from the Punjab into the Ganges Plain, a direction opposite to the spread of the Harappa culture. 
There is a beautiful and graphic description in the Shatapada Brahmana of the migration eastwards of Aryan speakers from the Doab to the Middle Ganges plain. It is said that the leader of this migration carried Agni in his mouth, which I think is a remarkable symbolism of all kinds of possibilities. The geographical starting point of the Indo-Aryan culture would be the area known to the Rig Veda. Were there any antecedents? There is the intriguing relationship of Indo-Aryan, the language of the Rig Veda, with Old Iranian, the language of the earliest gathas of the Avastha, connected to northeastern Iran. Cultural affinity is suggested by the closeness of the two languages, by the worship of Mitra and Varuna, the earlier deities of the Rig Veda, and at least one important ritual, the Soma sacrifice, which is, however, limited to just these two cultures and is not found in other Indo-European cultures. Therefore, there are divergences, but very many similarities also in the old Iranian and Indo-Aryan cultures. And we have to still work out the relationship between them. The Avastha recalls a migration stage by stage from Central Asia to what they call the Hapta Hindu, the Sapta Sindhu, India, the Indus. But what about the language picture in, in, in these times? The Rig Veda again marks a differentiation between the Aryas who speak the language of the hymns and others such as the Dasas and the Dasyus who seem not to do so. Those who cannot speak the language are referred to as the Mlecha. And typically the Mlecha we are told confuse the R and the L sound. Interestingly, this persists for many centuries and is found in a few inscriptions of Ashok Maurya, where he is referred to sometimes as Laja Magade instead of Raja Magade. Linguistics informs us of certain characteristic elements of the Dravidian languages that also appear in Indo-Aryan. For example, the inclusion of retroflex sounds. This is historically well worth noting because it occurs only in Indo-Aryan and not in other related languages of the larger Indo-European family. Similarly, Indo-Aryan alone borrows some vocabulary from Dravidian. The evidence from a comparative study of the two languages suggests that the Aryan speakers lived in the proximity of speakers of Dravidian and other languages. There are references to the Aryavarna and the Dasavarna. We know about the culture of the Arya, but the Dasa remains enigmatic. The Dasas are culturally differentiated. The terms used to describe them, such as a manusha, implicitly sets them apart. They are called a deva, without recognizable gods, and are said to be phallic worshippers. Of course, their language is also not the same. So a question that is being asked these days is whether they could have been the lesser post-Harappan communities. Nevertheless, some of them are wealthy with large herds of cattle. Cattle raids are very frequent at this time, cattle being an item of wealth. The Aryas were associated with the horse, a much revered animal for them. And the identity of the Dasa is difficult to determine at this point. In the subsequent period, Dasa refers to subservient groups as 
dasas and dasis. These were generally the impoverished or low status people in servile occupations. And the more impoverished among them were inevitably the women. When wealth is counted, the list includes cattle, horses, and dasis, among other things like gold and chests of this, that, and the other. This is also linked to a small but puzzling category of people described as Brahmins who are the sons of Dasis. One would expect such Brahmins to have a low status, and indeed that is what is said of them in one story. But the story has its own interest. It narrates that the Brahmins, when conducting a ritual of sacrifice, objected to the presence of a Dasi Putra because of his low status. The Dasi Putra then recited an appropriate mantra and prayed to the gods, and the river Saraswati began to follow him. So the Brahmins realized that he cannot be dismissed, and they invited him to join them and became appropriately deferential. A few of the respectable sages also of these texts are said, said to have been sons of Dasis. Among them, the very famous one, which was mentioned in the Upanishads, uh, Satyakama Jabala. So these were Brahmins born of Dasi mothers and presumably had Brahman fathers, and that would have allowed them Brahman status. If so, then it suggests that the more highly accomplished members of this mixed community could be incorporated into the community of Aryan speakers and given high status. This might explain the intermeshing of languages. In some ways, this pattern appears to parallel what is being suggested in the genetic analysis of the DNA data from Harappan and post-Harappan sites, still in its preliminary stages, the examination of the data. The reading so far is that the Harappan data points to the presence of indigenous hunter-gatherers together with farmers from Iran, with no evidence of people from Central Asia. But in the post-Harappan period, that is around 4,000 years or so before the present, there is additionally a presence from Central Asia. What the genetic data suggests is a large admixture of populations in the ancestry of Indians. And in this, we are no different from any other major cultures elsewhere in the world. One of the things that genetic analyses are teaching us is that there is no such thing as absolute purity of descent. We are all hopelessly mixed. If we combine all these sources, what do they tell us about migration and culture? The settlements in the Sapta Sindhu region, the northern Indus, the upper Indus region, uh, settlements of those who called themselves Aryas, meaning the respected people, appear to be in proximity to people who are labeled as Dasas and from whom the Aryas differentiate themselves. What were the elements of this interface? Migration meant some adjustment in their earlier culture when adapting to a new environment and possibly new people. Is there an intermingling of cultures? This happens sometimes when, after the harvest is cut, farmers invite pastoralists to let their animals graze on the stubble in the fields. And through this process, the fields are more easily made ready for the next crop, 
and animal droppings add manure to the fields. This is what is sometimes called symbiosis. And it leads to a closer uh, interdependence between the two, the pastoralist and the farmer. If the migrants come with a better technology, such as horse-driven chariots and the use of iron in place of bronze technology, they have an edge over the locals. In the intertwining of cultures, many factors are involved. Historians today are less concerned with the question of the origin of the Aryans and much more concerned with how the cultures which they gave rise to actually evolved. We therefore have to ask what other elements contributed to the making of these cultures that emerged. The language may mutate. New mixed social identities take shape and religious forms relate to some old and some new features. My second example <clears throat> is from the same area of Central Asia and Northern India, but a millennium later. The frequency of migrations strengthened the links between the two regions. Both migrants and the host cultures amidst which the migrants settled provide sources of this. The type of migration in this example differed from the first. These who came now were initially pastoralists, but who had gradually become traders. This was almost a typical pattern in Central Asia. It encouraged traders to settle in India and traders from India the host country to settle in the locations from which the migrant traders had come. Chinese texts describe many nomadic pastoral clans of Central Asia located to the northwest of China in areas adjoining Xinjiang and also around the Taklamakan and the Gobi deserts. The more powerful of these were the Shungnu, who had immense conflicts with the Yueshi, each anxious to control more pastures. The Yueshi being ousted, they migrated slowly westwards to the Oxus region to Bactria. Again, the region just north of the northern Indian mountains. A section of the Yueshi, the Kushans, were more ambitious. They extended their control southwards to the upper Indus area, including Gandhar, and further into northern India as far as the Ganges plain. Initially, this was a pastoral migration, followed by the Kushan conquest and eventually by trade. And as the groups moved south of the Oxus, they met others also linked to the same region, namely the Indo-Greeks, the Shakas, the Parthians, who had ruled the area of the Upper Indus and Gandhar and Bactria prior to the Christian era. These were replaced by the Kushans taking over authority and gradually the area changed from the dominance of migrant peasant communities to becoming a sedentary state with settled communities and finally forming a substantial commercial hub. How was this made possible? The Kushans brought with them a major item that went back to their pastoral days but which they converted very cleverly into a commercial asset. This was the Central Asian horse. The horse became crucial to armed warfare, as in the cavalry and the chariot wings of the army. 
This made it a prized item in commerce, both with China and India, competing to import horses. China, in turn, produced endless bolts of the luxury item, silk. So trade began with a preliminary system of what is called gift exchange. That is, presenting one party, presenting gifts as part of a formal, almost diplomatic exchange to the other. The Chinese presented bolts of silk, which they were producing in vast quantities, to the aggressive pastoral clans in order to pacify them. The pastoralists in turn supplied the Chinese with horses. This eventually led to complex trade connections and in other items as well and over very long distances from the eastern parts of Central Asia to the western areas of Bactria, the Oxus and even further west. Spices, cotton textiles, carved ivory items and pearls were exported from India. Glassware and gems came in large quantities from Europe, not to mention, of course, the amphorae of wine and oil. This ensured wealth for all uh, who were involved in the trade, and its success was recognized in the circulation of gold coins. Erstwhile pastoralists became transporters and eventually participants in the trade. And by the early centuries AD, the demand for silk was enormous from the Roman Empire, as was the demand for horses from India and China. The silk routes were just buzzing with activity. Kushan presence in the Northwest coming as far as the Ganges plain had its focus in Mathura. This suggests that controlling trade routes was more lucrative than merely territory. The objects from excavated sites that have emerged in large numbers reflect a new commercial culture in which the erstwhile migrant groups are recognizably present. The three indices of culture that I referred to earlier changed in this region. A change of language is indicated in Kushan inscriptions. Alexander's campaign earlier had opened up the Oxus Plain to settlers from the Hellenistic Greek kingdoms of West Asia. Greek was therefore the preferred language. But the Kushan king Kanishka adopted the Bactrian language instead, perhaps because it was used by the prestigious Sasanian power in neighboring Persia. What did this change of language imply? It had an effect, an influence on a change in Northern India. In replacing Greek with Bactrian, the replacing of Greek with Bactrian was to assert Kushan authority. But Kanishka did not introduce Bactrian into India. He patronized the local Indian languages. And curiously, the early use of high quality Sanskrit for royal inscriptions is associated with the Shaka ruler Rudradaman. Sanskrit now became the language of most royal inscriptions. It was already the language of learning, but this was a new use it was put to. Language was tied to claims of status, as in the titles taken by these kings, such as Maharaj, Rajati Raj, Devaputra, Kushan. This was a substantial claim by erstwhile pastoralists and reflects their now becoming rooted and powerful in Sanskrit using areas. Nevertheless, the migrant identity was not entirely forgotten. 
It is interesting that in the 11th century AD, the historian Kalhana, uh, writing the history of Kashmir, the Raja Tarangani, describes the Kushans as Turushkas, Turks, thereby associating them with Central Asia. Trade opens up the regions and other aspects of life are also affected. In the early centuries AD, Bactria and Gandhar became focal centers of interchange in religious movements. I would like to draw attention to two connected to India, one more local and the other that swept across Asia. To start with the first, the worship of the goddess was extensive in this area of Central Asia and the preeminent goddess was Nana. Her status was raised when the Kushan kings became her patrons and linked her to kingship and power. Her icons showed her riding a lion. In India too, goddesses were commonly worshipped, as was Durga. The question, however, is whether the Kushan version of Nana was linked to depicting the power of Durga by making the lion her mount. It is intriguingly said of Durga in some few texts that she is also worshipped by various lich clans. The more impressive cultural impact of the Kushans was their being a conduit for the spread of a new form of Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism. This had its genesis in the area held by the Kushans. A number of features new to Buddhism were introduced. The Buddha acquired elements of divinity and his image began to be worshipped. The icon tended to take on the features of the people who were worshipping it. Bodhisattvas now entered the Buddhist narrative and these were there to help those seeking Nirvana. Buddhist texts were written in the local version of Prakrit, Gandhari Prakrit, and in Sanskrit. Buddhism had always been strengthened by the powerful institution of the monasteries, now accompanying the establishment of Buddhism outside India. Buddhist monks traveled with the traders from India to Oasis towns in Central Asia, such as Kucha and Dunhuang, and from there, some continued into China. Mahayana Buddhism reached out to both the pastoral communities and the traders. But the late first millennium, by the late first millennium AD, Buddhism was the significant religion in Central Asia, Eastern Asia and Southeastern Asia. This incidentally was also the period when it was being slowly edged out of India, barring in a few places. My third example is of migrants from an altogether different geographical region who came as traders. The cultural change can often be more evident in the new communities that they create rather than in the host society. This often happened along the west coast of India that constantly received migrant traders. Throughout the centuries, the Arabian Sea has connected Southern Arabia, the Red Sea and East Africa with the littoral of Western Asia. Let me say one thing in connection with maritime history and Indian Ocean history that uh, Professor Satish Chandra was so uh, interested in. It was always treated, seas were always treated as areas of, of distancing. In fact, they're very often areas of people coming together. And, and this is a very interesting aspect of the past of the world. <clears throat> 
history of the world. In the period around the Christian era, trade was a source of impressive wealth with investments from Eastern Mediterranean merchants. The Roman Empire declined, but this trade witnessed the growing participation of West Asian traders. Arab presence in places along the West Coast is recorded from the 9th century AD. A Rashtrakuta inscription states that the Tajik Arab governor of Samyan, Sanjan, the area north of Mumbai, was a man named Madhumati, which is a Sanskritized form of Muhammad. He granted a village and some land to a Brahman in order that the Brahman maintain a temple dedicated to the goddess Bhagwati Devi. This is a neat interlink of an Arab governor working for the Rashtrakuta kings, making a substantial grant to a Brahman for maintaining a temple dedicated to a goddess. Another point of interest is that the location, this particular location, was linked to a Parsi Anjuman in Sanjar. Zoroastrian traders had migrated from Persia from about the eighth century onwards and settled in this part of the West Coast. They were the ancestors of the present Parsi community. Tradition has it that the migration was of Zoroastrians escaping from having to convert to Islam. But curiously, they chose to settle in Sanjan and in the vicinity of a town with a sizable population of Arab traders. There is no reference to hostility or forced conversion. And one, one wonders, therefore, that could it have been that the attraction of lucrative trade also brought the Persian migrants? They spoke the local language, Gujarati. And as we all know that today there is a special kind of Gujarati, which is actually referred to as Parsi Gujarati, which is a bit different from the other. Uh, they spoke Gujarati. They were encouraged to adopt the local marriage rules, but this did not include caste. They maintained their own forms of worship and they were required to abjure violence. This was a case of the migrants retaining their belief systems, but foregoing their language. However, this was not the pattern for all migrant traders on the West Coast. Those that did mix and merge with local communities, including through intermarriage, often assimilated cultural facets from them. And this gave rise to new identities. A number of Arab traders settled in the coastal areas from Kerala to Gujarat, and in, in their interaction with local communities, gave rise to new communities such as the Mapilas, the Navayats, the Bohras, and the Kojas, and such like. These areas were familiar to the reach of trade across the Arabian Sea. It went back many centuries to maritime trade between coastal India and the states across. The island of Socotra, for example, was a central hub as was Yemen a little later. The traders as migrants were making existing ties stronger by settling the, in the areas with which they traded. The languages of these migrant communities differed since the areas where they settled had different languages, Gujarati, Konkani, Malayalam, and so on each of which the migrants made their own. In the process, the use of Arabic became more marginal. The name Bohara, for instance, comes from the Gujarati word for trade, Vyavahara, 
The communities that emerged acquired differentiated identities that drew on the cultures of existing local communities. But they also had some connections with Yemen and East Africa. Distinctive identities were expressed in distinctive forms of belief and worship that drew both from the religions of their homeland and of the places where they settled. The Bohoras and Kojas of Gujarat were recognizably different from, for example, the Mapillas of Kerala, because the local Indian identities differed. Despite the Arab ancestry, their religious identities also differed from the conventional Islamic identity, such as that of the Turks and the, and the Afghans, nor indeed were the Hindu elements in their religion identical with the conventional ones. There is a very moving inscription from Saurashtra, a memorial inscription, in memory of Bohra Muhammad, who died defending Somnath against the attack of a Delhi Sultan. The early Khojas combined beliefs from Vaishnava and Sufi traditions. Somewhat like the Bhakti tradition, they also had poems and hymns that were popularly sung. They were contributing to the exploration of belief systems or what one might describe as the mixing and matching of religious ideas that has been so characteristic of the history of every religion in India. This changed in modern times when with the sharper definition of formal religions, those with flexible identities had to choose between the two major ones. I have spoken about aspects of migration in pre-modern times, but I would like to conclude by pointing out that this was a world of long ago and even the connotation of migration has been changing in our times. The meaning of migration changed in colonial times and the process was altered out of all recognition. It now involved colonial authority organizing the transportation, mostly involuntary or through capture, of men and women from one part of the world to another distant part from which they could rarely or never return home. The purpose was to use them as forced labor, as slaves or near slaves living in impoverished conditions and constantly under the threat of death. Needless to say, these were colored peoples, mainly Asians and Africans. They were visibly different from the white settlers who came largely voluntarily as free men to work and own the land that they settled on, the settler societies. This category had some touch of the migrant of earlier times. The world they were all sent to was newly conquered by Europe where after decimating the original inhabitants, the new arrivals, if white, found a future, and if colored, were put to labor. For the latter, migration became a polite word for forced labor. The meaning of the term migrant was infused with colonial connotations. There were some minor migrations within countries from one area to another but nothing that really changed the cultures of the different societies involved. The change from colony to nation state meant defining national boundaries. These were basic to giving a physical reality 
to what otherwise has been described by some as imagined communities. The roaming migration of pastoralists became impossible. Earlier trade connections had been broken with Asia divided up between diverse colonial powers who alone controlled the economy. By the time that ex-colonies became independent nation states, many among them had internalized the identities of race, language, and religion that they had accepted from colonial readings of their past. Hence, the history of the word migration is now seeing another turn of meaning in the context of nation states. It has become a qualifier for exclusion in European and Asian nation states, where exclusion may be defined by a supposed race or by religion and doubtless by much else. The precisely defined clear cartographic boundary lines enclosing territory is now a major identifier. It is no longer the rather casual and somewhat fuzzy frontier zones of earlier times. But the contradiction is that history also makes it quite apparent that there have been few, if any, permanent boundary lines in the past. These change constantly. Societies that have experienced centuries of history have had to internalize change at many levels. Civilization in itself is a process by which the porosity of societies leading inevitably to a, kernel, uh, to a cultural mix is apparent. Societies with an ancient past such as ours have in particular to try and understand how those from the other side of the deserts, the mountains, the forests, the seas, and immersed in diverse cultures were assimilated into our cultures. Similarly, how and why did so many people from our subcontinent travel to distant places in Asia and settle into other societies, creating together with them new cultural identities? It seems to me that what history is telling us is that recognizing the presence of migrants and the cultures that evolve from this presence is part of the process of recognizing and defining who we are. Thank you. Thank you, Robina. Uh, that was an absolutely riveting lecture as always. I'm sure that the audience uh, that has flocked to hear you today will bear this out in their later reactions as well, which I'm sure the host will uh, share with you. I'm personally uh, very obliged that I could be part of this wonderful experience. I would just like to make a very, very brief comment before I ask you a couple of questions from the ones that have appeared and are still appearing actually in the question and answer box. Uh, I think you summed it up in the middle of your lecture at one point when you said there is no purity of descent. So the search for pure roots, the search for exclusionary identities is a fruitless search because as you said, we are hopelessly mixed. And that in many ways, I think is the sum of the message that I get from your lecture. Of course, towards the end, you spelt it out even more when you came to discussing the more contemporary period and pointed out 
the limitations and the distortions and the dangers of exclusionary nationalism, which tends to define identities in terms of who are original inhabitants and who are the migrants. Of course, the famous debate on the Aryan migration or Aryan invasion, which is one of the first questions I will ask you, it takes us back to that. So thank you very much uh, for setting the tone. And I'm sure your audience discovered that you were very uncomfortable outside the BCs <laughs> when you happily talked about uh, the colonial period and the period right now. <laughs> but I will leave that to them. Uh, but uh, let me quickly ask you a couple of uh, questions. Uh, and in the meantime, while you answer them, I'll take a look at the ones that are suddenly now appearing in large numbers on the screen. But there were two. Uh, the first one was, do we call it Iron Migration or Aryan Invasion? I'm sure you expected this question. And the second one, if you want to do it all together, is uh, did migrants help later invasions? Is there any evidence of that? Did Muslim traders who came from the 18th century play a role in later Turkish invasions? I will in the meantime look at the other questions. All right. Um, yeah, this is the stock thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the colonial period, the, the the theory was Mortimer Wheeler, up to the time of Mortimer Wheeler, in fact, the theory was that the Harappa culture fell because of the Aryan invasion. And everybody talked about the Aryan invasion. Now, by about the 50s and 60s, archaeologists all over working on India and Indian archaeologists as well, overthrew the idea of invasion and said it simply isn't possible. Yes. There is no evidence. Yeah. You, you can't hear me? No, no, we can hear you. We can oh. hear you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, and uh, so we all stopped talking about invasion because we realized that this was something, something for which there was absolutely no evidence. But when you look at the data, the kind of data that I was suggesting about, you know, the, 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 the distance between those who compose the hymns and these other people, there was a cultural distance. And then all these references to, in, in the Indo-Iranian Indo texts, to Central Asia and migrations and so on. And this geographical movement of going from the Punjab eastwards, um, made us realize that migration was a possibility. And you know that this, the reason why I'm arguing that it is very important to study migration is because there are characteristic features in the process of migration, which some of us see in the texts, in the Vedic texts. Now, the, the point is that you, you have to find an explanation why a particular culture or particular cultures in this case exist. And so you have to look at the, the history of each culture, taking it as far back as you can in terms of what are the kinds of things that went into the making of the culture. There isn't only one item, there isn't only language, and there isn't only religion. There are multiple issues and concerns. And now, of course, with science moving into archaeology, uh, we chaps are getting pushed right away because the scientists are really the ones that have the evidence and have very clear evidence of even of things changing and why they change and so on. So the, the issue, of course, is, and the reason why I began with this long prelude of saying it is not migration, is not invasion. The two processes are historically completely different, as I tried to explain. And so uh, uh, if you are going to say that there was an invasion, you have to produce the evidence for it. And there is no evidence for it. Then 
the alternative is, are they indigenous or was there a migration? Was there some other way in which they trickled in? Uh, the theory that they were indigenous is very difficult to hold because there are so many multiple other things going on and there are groups of Indo-Aryan and Indo-European speakers all around. Uh, where did they come from? They certainly didn't come from India. They, they, they came from somewhere. So there, was, there were groups of people who were speaking these languages on the peripheries of the Indian subcontinent. And the other thing also, which is very important, is that if you are going to say that, no, uh, they are indigenous, how do you define the boundaries of what is indigenous? The boundaries are not the boundaries of British India, for God's sake. We're talking about 4,000 years ago. The boundaries were completely different. I mean, for all we know, there might have been a combination of the Indus, uh, the upper Indus and Gandhar and northeastern Iran almost forming a very closely knit cultural unit. Now, where are the boundaries of British India in all of this? They're cutting through. So what do you mean when you say indigenous? And then when, you talk, when we talk about all these other groups outside India with similar cultures, we're told, oh yes, they all went from India. There's absolutely no evidence of that. So the, the point really is that what we have to look for today is what is, what is the argumentation? I mean, in, in, instead of just getting up and abusing people, which is very often what happens, what is the evidence for people, this entire culture evolving in an in indigenous way? And what is the evidence for suggesting that there were migrants that came from outside, which brought items of culture or, you know, helped in the creation of the new culture. So this is, it's a question that, um, frankly, many of us are extremely bored with because it's been going on and on for, what, 70 years now. I mean, in 1969, and in, in, yes, 1969, when I was president of the ancient Indian history section, I did a, a presidential address on this question in which I very clearly started off by saying there was no Aryan invasion. And I talked about migrations. To this day, the people on the side of, it was all indigenous, keep on saying so-and-so and her theory of the invasion of the Aryans. I mean, how often do you say the same thing and how often do you write and explain that you don't believe in this thing and they go on saying the same thing. They, they simply do not read what people write. This is a very major problem that we don't read sufficiently widely. I mean, people who today stand up and condemn the... Uh, uh, the genetic evidence, the DNA evidence. Very few have taken the trouble to actually read the data because it's tough. It's not easy. You have to be a geneticist to understand it. But there are plenty of people who write in the newspapers every day about how it's complete nonsense. I mean, the, the, it's, it's a crisis also. It's not just an Aryan <laughs> migration crisis. It's a crisis in education and the understanding of the importance of knowing something about a subject before you stand up and shout. Yeah. And I don't know what the solution to that is. Sorry, what was your second question? I forgot in all of this. Well, uh, the second question was that did migrants help later invasions? Do we have any evidence of that? Uh, not that Especially we have. Especially Muslim. Did Muslim yeah. traders help later? Well, I mean, we have the contrary evidence, as I quoted. Uh, uh, Muhammad Bohora, for example, who is a Bohora. Yes. 
is fighting in defense of Somnath against the Delhi Sultan. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's a lot of evidence of this kind once you start going into local source. This is again where Satish's idea of one man must go to the local archives is terribly important mm -hmm. because it's only in the local archives that you will really find uh, the evidence for what people were thinking and doing and acting in a local area. There's one question which uh, I think I would like to bring to your attention, which is somebody says all your examples were from northern India. What about the south? Well, I'm That's sorry. Here. Yeah, yeah, I'm perfectly aware of that. My problem is that uh, I have all my life specialized in North Indian history. I think it would be outrageous on my part to hold forth on South Indian history, which I haven't really studied in depth. <laughs> if I had studied it in depth, I would certainly have brought in examples. And my bringing in examples was not to cover the whole subcontinent, because my goodness, the examples that I should have then brought in were the examples from Eastern India, where the whole question of migration from the 18th century onwards has been an absolutely crucial question. Uh, but it's not an area that I know. So I, I was giving these examples simply to say that the, these kinds of situations occur in every part of the country. If I'm talking about the West Coast, now the Mapillas, for example, are South India. Um, why don't people make these kinds of studies and compare them with the people on the Eastern Coast who also received Arab traders? and had cultural formations. And so why don't we have comparative studies of that kind? And I hope that the person who asked this question, if he or she is a historian, will do some comparative studies. <laughs> There's another one relating to South India, which I think you might want to look at. How, how do you look at the Cholas as conquerors or migrants in the context of Java and Indochina? Uh, well, I would first of all not say the Cholas uh, because there are multiple groups of various kinds that went to Southeast Asia. You had royal policy, state policy. That's one thing. So you're interested in those who are trading in luxury goods and bringing in wealth. And when that meets with an opposition across the seas, you may send out your navy. Or you may send out. Them. That's one kind of thinking. The Cholas certainly didn't conquer any land in Southeast Asia. Uh, they were very, the, as, as royalty, they, as, as royal policy, they were very interested in the trading policy. Yes, as indeed were many, many categories of castes, classes, call them what you will, who were also interested in, in, this, in this policy. Um, one would again have to do some work on when the traders go out from Tamil Nadu to these areas, where do they settle? Who do they settle with? Do they integrate or do they ghettoize? This is a very fundamental question and it's a question that hasn't been asked. I mean, the great, uh, the more recent 19th, 19th, early 20th century traders, uh, the Chettinar area, um, Chettiars. What was their relationship with the people that they traded with? I mean, I, I don't know. Some, maybe somebody has worked on it. I simply don't know. So I'm not in a position to expound on it. But if someone hasn't worked on it, I hope that what I said today will lead to someone working on it. One question on which I'm sure you will have a lot to say is, what is the, was there a concept of nation in early India? No, of course there wasn't. I mean, this is a question that keeps coming up. I've had arguments about this, not only here, but with uh, historians in Europe. There are uh, very few who still go on and on about how some of the medieval kingdoms were nations. No. I am afraid on this issue, I am very much with people who have written on nationalism, like 
Ben Anderson, Eric Hobsbawm, Ernst Gellner, Smith, all these people who studied it very carefully. And I am of the firm opinion that nationalism is a historical phase. Like we've had historical phases right through from the year dot. Uh, this is a change. And what is a change? It is the, uh, the demise of what is loosely called feudalism and feudal society and the coming in of a totally new society where you have political democracy with secularism, where you have the aristocracy giving way to the middle class and where you have the economy changing to industrialization and capitalism. These are absolute inputs into nationalism. So you didn't have nationalism in the past. It is a 19th century phenomenon. And it comes to us through the root of anti-colonialism, which is very different from nationalism in Europe. Right. And so one has to look at how it comes to a particular society. Maybe this you're could... cheating because you are asking me questions, <laughs> not on the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> well, the... <clears throat> this could possibly be then the last question. I don't know. Uh, the organizers, whether they still have time or not, but uh, the Saraswati, the so-called Saraswati Valley excavations, how do they tie up with the debate on the Aryan migration or invasion? Oh, we're back <laughs> on that again. <laughs> you can never get away from them. <laughs> No, I, you know, I really do think that we should call a moratorium on that and get going with the real historical questions, which yes. are far more fun fundamental. I mean, to prove that there was a Saraswati River, that there, was, there were many Harappan sites on the Saraswati River, is all to try and say that instead of calling it the Indus civilization, we should call it the Saraswati civilization. And why? Because that gives precedence to... Uh, Aryanism, Vedicism, Saraswati is only associated with the Vedic texts. It's not, we don't know whether the Harappans called it Saraswati, the river or not. They probably didn't. Anyway, so it's all those issues that come in, which in a sense, fog that history. All right, people have had their say. Everybody's had their say. There are multiple publications on this. Please let's move on. Let's move on to the real historical issues that are much, much more important than whether there was a river Saraswati or not. Okay. All right. I think uh, probably we have had a substantial number of questions, enough for people to get a uh, flavor not only of Romila delivering a lecture, but Romila at her best debating, <laughs> arguing, <laughs> countering, telling people to read more, come back after you've read, <laughs> and don't raise irrelevant questions. So I'm sure they've all got a substantial uh, view of your beautiful, yeah, wonderful I'm, personality, Romila. I'm afraid <laughs> this is the many years of teaching. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's right. So may I now hand over to Akhil Chandra? Akhil? Yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Mridula. So good evening, everybody. And uh, like uh, all good things, uh, this uh, second uh, annual Professor Satish Chandra Memorial Lecture must also come to an end. And uh, on behalf of uh, Professor Satish Chandra's family, uh, I would like to propose a, a vote of thanks. Uh, of course, uh, starting off with uh, Professor Romila Thapar, who has given us a most uh, enlightening and engaging lecture on migration in early India. And I think most importantly, how that migration has shaped us and uh, perhaps makes us what we are today. Uh, the layers uh, and the discussion dialogue obviously uh, very, very deep and a lot for us as an audience uh, and as uh, students uh, and family connected to Professor Chandra. Uh, uh, it's good, good, great material for us to reflect on. Uh, for Professor Robala Thapar, for somebody who's most comfortable in the first millennium, I, I must say uh, 
that uh, uh, Dr. Romela, you have adapted beautifully. We are on the cusp of the third decade of the third millennium, and you've adapted uh, fantastically to the technology that goes alongside. Uh, for the audience, uh, this was uh, Professor Thapal's first Zoom uh, video conference, and uh, I, I think it was absolutely impeccably done. Um, of course, uh, a great uh, thank you and a big thank you to uh, Professor Mithula Mukherjee. Uh, and of course, uh, Dr. Mukherjee, uh, you remain such a huge support uh, and an anchor for us as a family uh, to connect us uh, with what uh, my father stood for. And thank you very much for your very kind introduction uh, and reminding us uh, again, as, uh, as uh, children, we don't always know the meaning and impact of his work, but you very beautifully uh, brought that alive uh, to us again. So thank you very much for that. Um, of course, uh, organizing an event of this scale, we've had, I think, close to uh, 1,700 registrations. At the peak, we had close to 500 people uh, participating, or over 500 people participating on this event. Uh, so of course, uh, a very, very big thank you to Mr. Ravi Chandran and the Bangalore International Center and the team who have done an absolutely impeccable job uh, in bringing together this very uh, complex uh, uh, sort of uh, you know, webinar together, uh, which is being simulcast, of course, on Zoom, but also on YouTube. And the support team, Lekha and Raghu, who have worked seamlessly and beautifully uh, to do such an outstanding job. Uh, of course, uh, in, in thanking everybody, it would be a reverse of me not to say a huge thank you to my elder brother, Alok, uh, who has done an outstanding job in, uh, you know, been, and been the architect of really bringing the uh, Satish Chandra Memorial Lectures, an idea which he proposed three years ago, uh, into a reality and something which really is a fantastic testimony and, and a wonderful way to remember my father who stood for all the things today that uh, you, Dr. Mukherjee, spoke about that we are missing him for. And, and those are a constant reminder of, uh, of the work that he did and the values that he stood for, uh, brought together beautifully, I think, by uh, tremendous work, single-handedly, uh, by my brother Alok. But uh, a big thank you to him. And of course, uh, last but not the least, uh, it is the audience. We've had a tremendous uh, turnout. Uh, we've had, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, students of history. We've had friends. We've had uh, family. We've had people who've uh, all been very keen to hear uh, both, of course, uh, Dr. Ramallah Thapar uh, and also yourself, uh, Dr. Mukherjee, uh, to get together. So a huge thank you uh, to them all. So I really hope that everybody has enjoyed uh, this uh, this lecture, and uh, I'm sure that uh, you know the next lecture will be equally engaging, and uh, that's really uh, something that we all look forward to. So look forward to seeing everybody next year uh, in this event. Thank you very much. Just a final word, Akhil, if I may, that the, the the inspiration for the lectures came from Professor Syed Shahid Mehdi when right. we got together at the first anniversary in 1918. Wow. So yes. thank you um, uh, again, everybody. And goodbye and good night.